everybody. Good evening, Dr. Sabnis, uh, Dr. Singh, Dr. Devanar, and Dr. Sarkar. Good evening to all the students. I hope you're finding Eurovidya a very viable, useful platform for preparing for your exam. Again, I keep reminding you, like a broken record, this session is not meant for teaching. First phase of today will be a lecture, but it is not really a lecture. It is a answer script on urethral stricture question in the theory exam. Once that is over, there will be a case on candidates who will face the exam exactly like the examiner examining a student in the MCH program. You have to answer the questions, however elementary they may be, and the case will carry on and we will determine a pathway so that at the end of the session, you will know if such a case comes, what are the mistakes that you usually make in the exam hall and not to make that mistake. This memory, this Timing has been poised in such a way that before you forget this session, your exam is over. So today, the first session will be from Professor Sravan Singh's department, Professor Sudhir Kumar Diwana. He is going to take over from now. Sravan, could you please introduce Dr. Diwana so that he can then start? Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Sudhir Kumar Diwana, he is an associate professor the Department of Logy at PGI Chandigarh and has special interest in urethral stricture management. So I, I think uh, I can ask him and request him to please deliver the lecture, what a resident should know and how they can write a theory paper or an, uh, uh, his reply on urethral stricture. 
thanks so much for the introduction sir uh, good evening all uh, at the outset i want to thank professor amit ghosh uh, dr sabni sir and uh, sk singh sir for giving me an opportunity to uh, participate in this educative event for uh, the post graduate residents who are particularly appearing for the exam uh, i also thank uh, the euro vaidya team for also giving me this opportunity so i would be basically presenting a brief overview of the uh, uh, the how to evaluate a case of urethral stricture and how to examine and then uh, following followed by the uh, management plan on how to uh, treat uh, these cases so since urethral stricture is such a vast topic uh, it's uh, very difficult for you to cover the entire area of the urethral reconstructive procedures everything in a single class of 30 minutes but if at least briefly i am going to cover professor, the, professor devana professor can i just interrupt yes, they sir. know everything that is the assumption so you just need to guide them as to what are the points they should not miss and what should be the headlines and content we assume by by now they know more than us if they don't god help them yes sir so i will be Can basically uh, covering the male urethral uh, uh, structure uh, so these are the basic uh, this is a basic overview which we will be talking about the applied anatomy uh, uh, etiology history taking examination and uh, specifically the investigations and the decision making and surgical treatment followed by the follow up of these cases so all these areas would be specifically asked in an exam like coming to the applied anatomy yes uh, we all know that the uh, urethra male urethra is uh, divided into various area various parts the external urethral meatus which is the narrowest part and the fossa navicularis uh, the strictures which involve these two areas are specifically uh, managed in a different way when compared to the rest of the uh, urethra and the next the uh, pendular urethra followed by the uh, buccal urethra which is more proximal and then the membranous urethra and the prostatic urethra so the most narrowest part is the uh, is the external urethral meatus and uh, the rest of the urethra is a pretty wide when compared to the rest of the thing uh, coming to the cross section this part is very important particularly to understand the management of urethral structures uh, the caliber of the urethra particularly the spongios uh, corpus uh, spongiosum its cross section actually varies at different areas of the urethra like if you see the cross section at the distal part in the level of the glands you see the urethra is in the form of a vertical slit when you go a bit into the pendular urethra the spongiose tissue is thinner on all around so and if you see this has a clinical bearing whenever you are managing urethral stricture patients because you don't have a bulky spongiosal tissue to place a graft ventrally particularly when you are managing a pendular urethral stricture and then when you go more proximally where the bulbar urethra is there the bulbar urethra the thickness of the spongiosa tissue varies like if you see in this a slide a photograph there you see the urethra is actually eccentrically located more anteriorly and that means more dorsally and whereas the ventral part you see the spongiosa tissue is thickened and it is very bulky so at this area uh, you have the benefit of putting a graft even on the ventral side Uh, that is the most important point particularly whenever a ventral only uh, buccal mucosal graft urethroplasty being done for a bulbar urethra so this part has a very important applied anatomy which you all should understand and the next thing is the distal part of the urethra that is the uh, pendular urethra the distal part of bulbar urethra actually overlies over the corpus cavernous or bodies so that's why you have a good base for placement of a graft on the dorsal area particularly when you talk about the distal part whereas when you go more proximally obviously the crora both diverge and then the the bed at that area you will not find the corporal bodies there next important point about the bulbo spongiosus muscle yes this muscle has a very important role particularly for the ejaculation and also the expelling the few drops of urine which uh, remain in the urethra after a person voids so for those things this bulb muscle is very important so uh, any surgery you have to whenever you cut this muscle uh, when you are dealing with the bulbar urethral stricture you have to reconstruct it also properly otherwise the patient would have the symptoms of post void dribbling and also the, he will have a problem in uh, decreased force in the ejaculation as well so that is a part of uh, uh, this muscle and it is generally seen covering the proximal part of the bulbar urethra whereas the distal part of the bulbar urethra is free 
Uh, in these diagrams, I am just showing that how this bulbar, the bulbosponges muscle is actually attached in the midline in the form of a raphe with the, the bulbar urethra. So that would be, uh, uh, from that area, you have to separate the bulbosponges muscle during urethroplasty uh, to open, uh, to dissect the urethra further. And another important thing is, yes, definitely the strictures which are confined deep to this bulbosponges muscle, this part of where, where the bulbar urethra is thicker, like I said before, the sponges or tissue is thicker, so you can consider placing a ventral graft in this area. Whereas uh, the urethra, which is distal to the bulbar sponges muscle, generally there the ventral graft is not preferred. The reason being the thickness of the sponges or tissue there. Coming to the blood supply, it is a frequently asked question in exams always, uh, why uh, the, uh, uh, what you need to know about the blood supply of the urethra, uh, because it has a dual blood supply. One is the anti-grade, whereas the retrograde blood supply. So uh, retrograde, you can see the uh, blood supply is through the uh, dorsal artery of penis. The both dorsal artery of the penis and the bulbo urethral arteries, they are actually the branches of the common penile artery, which is nothing but a continuation of the internal penile artery. So obviously, if you see in this diagram, which is provided on the right side, the dorsal artery, it, it goes forward and it actually supplies the glands area and also some circumflex arteries also will come all along the way. So supposing if there is some deficiency in the blood supply uh, of this dorsal artery or, or if there is any interruption in this urethra, like particularly in hypospadias cases where the urethra is deficient distally, there the, and the, uh, anti -grade, uh, the retrograde supply is not there to the urethra from the front. So the entire urethra would basically be dependent on the uh, uh, retrograde supply from the, uh, the bulbo urethral arteries. So that's why in such cases, whenever you're planning a reconstruction, you should think in mind that already one of the blood supply is cut off. So you should make every attempt to preserve the remaining blood supply. Otherwise, the success of the urethroplasty will fail. And uh, many a times road traffic accidents where PF pelvic fracture urethral distraction cases being dealt, uh, there, there is a because of pelvic fracture, sometimes the internal pudendal artery also gets damaged. So in such cases also, you should think that obviously there is a decrease in blood flow through the, to the urethra, either from the bulbar urethral artery or the dorsal artery of penis. And coming to the double strictures, yes, sometimes you have a proximal and also distal stricture. When you are managing a distal stricture and if there is a need for transection of the urethra, obviously you have to think that the, the supply from the uh, glands to the retrogradely is not there. So these are all very important points that dual blood supply has a very important role, particularly for the success of the uh, urethroplasty. And how do you know that the supply is good or not in the preoperative examination? Many a times, uh, uh, many authors suggest that the sensation of the glands or the glands is uh, the temperature, like sometimes the glands feels more, more cold. Uh, these suggest that the supply to the anti-grade root is lesser, particularly when you are taking history of patients of uh, pelvic fracture urethral distraction defect. And then the bulbo urethral artery, yes, everybody knows the exact location that they are generally located at five and seven o'clock uh, position. Like in this video, you see where we are operating a case of pelvic fracture urethral distraction defect. But obviously in, in those cases, you have to transect the urethra. The moment you transect the urethra, the bulbo urethral ar arteries invariably they get cut off there. So they are actually located exactly at five and seven o'clock position. And you can see this putting uh, artery here. Uh, the, which will anyway go in a case of progressive perineal urethroplasty. Uh, coming to the etiology, yes, in history tracking, obviously you should ask those questions in the history which actually partly reflect uh, the etiology of the uh, urethral stricture disease. Like part, uh, if you, there is a such infection, the etiology could be due to infection, particularly gonococcal infection, any history of uh, pus discharge through the urethra, any history of contact leading to urethritis and so on and so, on and so forth. So that history should be asked particularly the, and coming to the BXO, of course, more majority of the times the BXO is detected on examination. And then the uh, traumatic history, always whenever there is a straddle injury, the most common side, which is which the patient is going to have injury is the proximal bulbar urethra. Why? Because the proximal bulb is actually sitting on the inferior pubic ramus and also the pubic symphysis. So at that area, the uh, trauma can lead to crush injury to the bulbar urethra. And this has important bearing related to the treatment also. So whenever you have an urethral stricture disease involving the proximal bulbar urethra secondary to straddle injury, you expect significant amount of adhesions and scarring in the urethra. And many a times these strictures land up in 
resection and removal of the uh, structured part that is excised and then only you have to either do end to end anastomotic urethroplasty or if the segment is long enough you have to do a, a flap procedure so many a times these cases of bulbar urethroplasty land up in excision and then anastomosis because of the severity of the crush injury then the iatrogenic most commonly asked questions about this the any form of urethral instrumentation that too you have to take that history and the most uh, frequent site which get injured are the bulbomembranous urethra the penoscrotal junction and the meatus and the, the navicular fossa why because these areas you obviously when there is a uh, at the penoscrotal junction you have a bend of the urethra and even at the proximal bulb there is a curvature so obviously the whenever any instrument is passed during any urethral procedure uh, it will obviously injure that area and then history of catheterization this is also very important so that also brings us into the etiology and these generally catheterization induced injury structures are generally mucosal or slightly uh, sp some part of uh, spongiofibrous will be there and they are not very bad when compared to a traumatic uh, straddle type of injuries then of course in many a times you might not get any history suggestive of any etiology then obviously that those are named as idiopathic and then the coming to the posterior urethra yes it's all together a different uh, uh, type of management and their history also will be in a different uh, uh, in a different line and these include the pelvic fracture urethral injury and the posterior urethral uh, structures secondary to post trp also so you in the history taking yes definitely uh, you should ask for the histories in exam many a times the chief presenting complaints of any case of urethral structure would be a decreased urinary stream and uh, the frequently asked question in exam is the how do you differentiate a stricture case from a uh, patient of uh, uh, bph if their patient is an elderly male coming with the decreased urinary stream uh, the most important uh, history point which differentiates them is when a, a urethral stricture disease when a patient strains the stream slightly improves whereas the contrary in case of bph the stream doesn't improve and then the history of the urethral stricture is generally very long standing and patient classically says that my stream has been slowly reducing over a period of so many months and then uh, he presents to you so long history and that uh, history should be very important and of some patients may even present with retention in the emergency they uh, they try to catheterize the catheter doesn't go and then the diagnosis of stricture comes up and uh, you always should ask history for the, are there any uh, discharge like pus discharge from the urethra are there any other openings or sinuses or any abscess formation which the patient uh, might have uh, because the basic etiology of urethral stricture is secondary to infection or inflammation is the formation of micro abscesses leading to uh, stricture formation so some patients do have the fistula also so that history also you should ask then coming to the um, uh, these th history points i have already covered in the previous slide like history of dysuria fever pus discharge trauma urethral instrumentation catheterization and then definitely the most important thing is the treatment history because treatment in history if there is any history of urethral dilatation or oiu or any sort of urethral surgery related to the stricture in the past that itself plays, places the case as a complex case so obviously you have to your outcomes will also be differ in that so these history you should have to in the history you have to ask in detail about how many attempts of oiu were done how for how many uh, long duration the patient has been using uh, dilatation May, many patients say that i have been doing dilatation for the past 4 5 years so these are all very important uh, that history should be there uh, while taking the case yes if there is a background of road traffic accident now in the exam obviously you think that it could be a case of pelvic fracture urethral distraction defect and details related to the accident is it by a run over or how or the exact way how the uh, 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 the event has happened that you should take uh, any history of blood at the meatus that is the most important question is generally asked and another important is did anybody attempt any contrast study through the urethra at that time of injury uh, if so then you have to take that history and many a times patients do give history of peripheral catheter uh, attempt Uh, during uh, uh, the history of trauma so um, you have to ask whether the catheter is passed if it doesn't go did they inflate the balloon many times patients even give the history that the balloon was inflated but after many hours uh, the urine didn't come only blood was coming and then subsequently it was removed and an spc was placed so that itself history says that the balloon was inflated at a wrong place and it might have worsened the injury so you are dealing with a more uh, further uh, difficult case so those history you should uh, mention Uh, then the 
uh, e, what had happened after the attempt of irritation and any other intervention. Sometimes people even undergo open surgery for placement of an SPC. Then uh, this as a completion part, I have mentioned in history taking that at the time of injury, you have to ask other bony injuries of long bones, abdominal organs. Many a times the patients do have a rectal injury or a perineal injury that has very important bearing. Now, whenever you are uh, dealing that patient, you have to examine those things also. And uh, the uh, abdominal and orthopedic surgeries, many a times these people undergo at the time of initial trauma and uh, any urethral procedure or surgery done for that, you have to mention. And then the most important thing is uh, patient, if the patient is already on an SPC, we many a times ask the patient whether any few drops of urine come through the urethra whenever this SPC gets blocked or sometimes while during straining when they pass, they have some sort of urinary uh, leak through the urethra that suggests that there is a, a at least a patency in the urethra and it's not a complete obliterative stricture. So that also will be, a, you will be getting by taking history. And bowel habits, yes, particularly in cases of rectal injury or a perineal injury, there the, sometimes there might be fistulae, which is with the rectourethral fistula could be their iatrogenic. So you have to ask history for pneumaturia and leakage of urine or fluid through the anus sometimes, because sometimes patients do complain whenever my SPC gets blocked, Suddenly, I'll uh, get some amount of uh, fluid or urine leaking through my rect uh, by the anal canal. So these are very important. And yes, uh, fecal incontinence, if it is there because of that perennial trauma, that also you should take history. And uh, erectile dysfunction history is very important because any procedure in the treating these patients, definitely you have to have a baseline erectile function evaluation. Uh, like, for example, if you are dealing with a case of pelvic fracture urethral injury, the history of erectile dysfunction is very important. If the patient doesn't have erections, you have to document it there and there itself and whether uh, uh, any drug helps in gaining, attraction, uh, gaining erections like PDE5 inhibitors, that also history you should uh, ask. If it is not helping him, then that's such that there could be some amount of vasculogenic injury and that calls for proper evaluation using a uh, pharmacological induced penile erection tests and uh, so that to see whether the cavernous arteries are flowing or not. If it, that is also negative, then obviously you will go for evaluation of the internal pudental artery by doing angiography as well. So because this has important bearing with the outcome of urethroplasty. So starting from history, you have to uh, uh, clear all these issues. And then the personal history is obviously uh, any surgery on the uh, urethra because you have bearing on the erectile dysfunction, these things would be there. So you have to ask his marital status and uh, whether he is sexually active or not. And uh, these things are very important. Now coming to the examination, yes, uh, any patient of urethral stricture, when you are taking uh, examination, you should always ask the patient to squat in front of you and then get up. That, that itself says that you can easily place this patient in a position of a lithotomy and I'm not saying for each and every patient particularly the trauma cases where there is a significant pelvic fracture sometimes patients do have a fracture of the femur or the pelvis where they have done some orthopedic implant procedure and they can't be uh, flex their hips in such a way that it is not possible for you to uh, even place in lithotomy position so it is very important to ask this question in during examination and if there is an SPC, the location of SPC also has important bearing. Sometimes the uh, suprapubic catheter is placed very close to the pubic symphysis. And uh, it has a lot of problem because whenever you're doing an erythroblasty in him, if you want to do an anti-grade bougie placement, uh, if it is very close to the pubic symphysis, it many a times is difficult to pass it. So always uh, pre uh, the SPC should be a little bit higher up and it should be in the midline. Otherwise, during surgery, you have to open the bladder and then uh, do this do uh, the proper uh, uh, passing the bougie under proper vision. Then the genital examination, phimosis, BXO changes, all residents might have seen a lot of cases of BX1. It's very important to note this finding because whenever there is BXO changes are there, obviously uh, you can't consider placing a, a skin-based grafts in such case for reconstructing the urethra. Obviously you have to go for a mucosal grafts like buccal or lingual. Any scars, sinuses, fistulous opening, previous insertions, many a times patients might have undergone multiple surgeries in the urethra. So obviously you have to look for the local skin, um, penile skin, is it scarred, is it mobile or is it fixed, any sinuses. These are very important. In such cases, obviously you generally go for a staged approach. And then the degree of spongiofibrosis. It's very important to palpate the urethra, the pendular and the bulbar urethra. Of course, the proximal bulbar urethra beneath the sponges muscle is the, you can't palpate it, uh, but the at least the rest of the urethra you have to feel how much spongiofibrosis is there. 
and the uh, coming to the digital rupture examination particularly in cases of pelvic fracture urethral distraction defect you have to look for the uh, tone of the uh, the anus and the whether there is any puckering or any uh, scarring in the anterior uh, wall of the anal canal and any sometimes you even feel bony spurs also there and next most important is is the prostate high riding or not because that will tell you whether this is a complex pelvic fracture urethral distraction defect or not coming to the oral examination yes many strictures complex strictures are managed with uh, graft procedures so obviously oral cavity examination and taking history of any uh, tobacco chewing uh, uh, or any difficulty in opening the mouth these things should be asked as a part of the examination particularly whenever you are planning any treatment for a stricture case a perineal examination yes i already said that like in this case you can see there are multiple scars, scars in the perineum and he even had sinuses at before so these these things you should note in the examination uh, whenever you are dealing with any stricture patient coming to the investigations the most commonly investigations done are the uh, uh, uroflometry i didn't uh, uh, in elaborately mention about uroflometry here Uh, yes, definitely. When the patient comes with a decreased urinary flow, uroflometry also uh, is a non-invasive process which is routinely done, and where you classically see the box pattern of uh, the uh, uroflow, uroflow, where that patient doesn't attain a significant peak because, and he will be having that sustained peak, and you will not have a, uh, a rise in that peak uh, in in uroflometry. and then calibration yes calibration uh, is a uh, is it helps you in many way that i am going to tell you and then the rgu and rgumc see calibration uh, like it what does it help it helps in basically it gives a rough idea about the urethral caliber why it is important is uh, having a urethral caliber of at least 6 6 french is generally needed for doing a substitution urethroplasty suppose if a, like in the picture provided here you can see the structure of the anterior urethra it is so narrow that the lumen is very less so uh, we can easily say that in this case the uh, catheter passing a catheter even if you do calibration also the catheter will not go much uh, these are near obliterate structure so these cases are managed differently on the contrary if on calibration any catheter goes inside then even if there is a, a small catheter which goes inside you can augment or substitute that urethra using graft so that's the usefulness of uh, calibration and uh, of course you will anyway roughly sometimes rgu can be confusing because if you have multiple strictures uh, it might falsely show a, a narrow lumen at one area but when you do calibration it actually goes beyond that area so so this has uh, some useful ness uh, uh, whenever you are evaluating a patient preoperatively rgu as you all know uh, like rgu it will show the uh, uh, rgu should be used only for commenting on the anterior urethra many a times residents keep commenting on the uh, prostatic uh, on the bladder neck and those things when in, during an rgu that's completely wrong we should only comment about the anterior urethra whenever you are reading an rgu like in these two pictures project seen there you can see the pendular urethra with a long segment structure was there non distensibility of the urethra is there in the distal part whereas the proximal bulbar urethra the distensibility is good is normal like here both the pino bulbar and distal bulbar urethra both are narrow uh, most important thing how you detect uh, the uh, where to what are the landmarks for uh, uh, identifying which part of urethra is affected during uh, an rgu how to identify it the, the most important common question is the you look into the obturator foramen and the lower border of obturator foramen exactly Uh, uh matches the area of the bulbo membranous urethra where it gets finished off so here in this case like this so and the rest of the urethra is the anterior urethra and pendular and bulbar urethra obviously whenever the the distal pendulous part if the for an x-ray if you bend that part of the urethra while doing rgu that part uh, uh, limits your uh, pendular urethra and the rest of the urethra would be the bulbar urethra like in this case you can see in the left image here the actual urethra so obviously this part is the Uh, panel urethra and the rest of the proximal part is the bulbar urethra in this case you can see a short segment structure here whereas here you can see a long segment urethral structure uh, rgu mcu yes uh, rgu mcu is done only in cases where there is complete blockage of the uh, anterior urethra because of the structure like in this case when you inject contrast if your contrast is not going beyond it and then obviously to know the proximal limit you have to do an mcu and invariably these patients generally are on spc so rgu mcu in the lateral position you have to see the uh, it will help you in uh, defining the extent of stricture 
and particularly in pelvic fracture uterine distraction defect cases you have to uh, look for uh, always in the plane you may look for any radio opaque shadow sometimes these patients on spc they might have a, a stone formation in the bladder then evaluate the bone bony injuries uh, whether there is straddle fracture or not like both the pubic rami are fractured in this case and then the length and alignment of the urethral defect of course the status of bladder neck is very important particularly in cases of uh, uh, pelvic fracture urethral distraction defect and there uh, whether the bladder neck is competent or not you have to uh, evaluate preoperatively only and the yes if there is contrast leak you should think of fistulae and uh, always you have to get a after the study you have to get a post evacuation film because when once the contrast entire thing washes off then you have to see whether there is sometimes there might be a leak which is posterior which you might have missed in a initial image so all these information you have to get and the status of bladder neck and membranous urethra is also very important whenever treating patients of urethral stricture because it has bearing in the post operative outcome like patients may do might have incontinence like particularly if a patient has history of radiation to prostate then obviously it can form uh, that radiation injury can extend on to the bulbo membranous area and that part of urethra can get damaged so the continence will have an issue in such cases particularly pfudd cases you have to know for the bladder neck, uh, the bladder neck status and surgeries like trp and bna obviously the bladder neck will be uh, gone and all the continence is purely maintained on the external sphincter coming to the decision making and planning of a case of stricture uh, always uh, whenever you are evaluating these cases based on history and examination when uh after examination and then uh, uh, investigations if we have a fair idea of the location of the stricture the length of the stricture the caliber caliber meaning how much is the uh, french that are we able to pass at least a small feeding tube or not like like i said before and then the complete obliterative or a non obliterative stricture the management differs and then the etiology definitely etiology if you consider the bxo and traumatic cases these cases do have a lot of significant scarring and Uh, they have a significant uh, uh, long uh, segment stitches in such type of cases and primary and recurrent cases obviously once a prior failed case comes to you uh, following a surgery outside obviously it is going to be a difficult one because one thing which you need to understand is that at that time sometimes if they do transection the urethra is also lost so obviously now you can't expect more uh, urethral mobilization otherwise you will develop cordy so these uh he uh, uh, stricture management depends on all these factors and this is a brief outline of management of uh, stricture which i have just made for convenience sake like uh, if you have an uh, anterior urethral stricture locate the site of the stricture like in this case penal urethra if it is involved so in penal urethra the problem is you can't mobilize the urethra significantly to do an end to end urethroplasty in that location because it will men it will lead to cardi so obviously these structures at this location are managed like using a single stage like a some putting a graft like patch repair or if the other features are there which i will tell for in the next slides the patient will go for a johansen stage repair the same if you go to bulbar urethra bulbar urethra the advantage is you have a mobility is there when you mobilize the bulbar urethra you will can gain some length so in such cases if it is a short, short segment structure the uh, you can offer a oeu of course oeu can be offered in even penal urethra but the best outcomes of oeu are there in the bulbar urethra mm, uh, and the uh, end to end anastomo anastomotic uh, urethroplasty can be done in short segment stitches that to 1 to 2 cm stitches particularly in bulbar urethra and if there is a long segment structure in bulbar urethra yes you go for substitution urethroplasty or you can go for augmented anastomotic urethroplasty or if the feature if there is a complete obliteration and a long segment you can go for stage repair and then both penal and bulbar urethra are involved obviously it's a long segment structure the same procedures again come the substitution urethroplasty or followed by johansen's repair either of the above i will be telling which procedure would you have to opt in the following slides then posterior urethra yes you have the uh, um, uh, pelvic fracture urethral distraction defect Uh, or you have the uh, 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 sphincter structures that is involving the bulbo membranous junction particularly patients who undergo trp where there is injury at that level uh, and then are the are the, the prostatic urethral structures most common are the pelvic fracture urethral injury obviously these are managed by progressive perineal urethroplasty whereas sphincter structures because there is a risk of incontinence these structures are generally managed uh, 
uh, with a dilatation or sometimes even grafting can be done but without uh, only the mucosal area is stripped and then a graft was placed full thickness excision is not done in this case because there is risk of injury to sphincter and then the prostatic urethral structure where which includes the uh, bladder neck contracture and also the complex structure in the prostatic urethra which are very uncommon and they uh, they are managed differently so few points which you should remember i already highlighted now like pendular penile urethra the mobility is less end to end anastomosis will lead to cardi and there is no need to repeat it and here i already said that you always look for the bxo changes generally bxo first involves the meatus meatal stenosis phimosis and then it extends proximally so pendular urethral structures if there is no other etiology then obviously you have to on examination look for these changes and the ventral free graft placement is not done in this location i already said because the spongiosal tissue is thin here you can't place a graft here because there is no bed ventrally and that's why the pedicle uh, grafts are considered if at all you want to use a graft pedicle, pedicle graft is considered in the ventral part and the main problem with that is the risk of ballooning and diverticular formation which can lead to post uh, uh, void dribbling the bulbar urethra yes there is inherent mobility all types of repairs are possible you can do multiple procedures uh, spongiosa is more thicker ventrally and i already said the ventral graft can be done the principles yes always whenever reconstructing urethra you have to create a lumen of the urethra at least up to 25 french because whatever the reconstruction by using graft or whatsoever after some time there is a contractility will occur or the graft shrinks and your lumen will decrease so at least you have to make, uh, create this much of lumen scarred urethral plate if it is there it should be excised in toto otherwise it can lead to failure the cut urethral margins what so if you are doing an entire urethral ostomy when you excise the scarred part the margin should bleed properly then only you should anastomose or if you are doing a substitution urethroplasty where you are putting a graft even there also the margins of the cut urethra should be bleeding laterally otherwise the, those will not heal and the closure should always be tension free closure and in case of persistent infection or severe scarring always go for a staged approach and uh, in in another next few minutes i will finish off the different techniques yes why you you all know this for short segment strictures it is best for bulbar urethra the short term outcomes are up to the percent 20 to 100% it's a wide range in published literature whereas the long term outcomes are always less uh, uh, 20 to 30% only and in any patient if you have underwent more than two optical internal urethrotomies uh, there is definitely a 100% chance of failure rate because it is going to recur anyway Uh, then you have to go for so in the history if you have two or you always consider either end to end urethroplasty or some other procedure for the case and complications like bleeding erectile dysfunction and stricture recurrence can occur and coming to end to end urethroplasty uh, it's the generally done for short segment urethral strictures like in this case you see in the bulbar urethra both the urethra are cut ends are bleeding they are spatulated on either side 1 cm into the normal urethra and then subsequently the anastomosis should be a tension free anastomosis uh the for long segment strictures the role of grafts come like free grafts you have pedicle grafts in free grafts the most commonly used grafts are the buccal mucosal graft and the lingual mucosal graft and the other graft which can be used which is available locally is the inner prepucial graft uh the pedicle graft uh, will be covered and these grafts are generally uh, done when these the use of these grafts is not suitable uh, then if you don't have any tissue available then do go for pedicle grafts as well and the grafts can be placed either dorsally or ventrally if you place dorsally it can be on lay or it can be in lay uh, the on lay technique is described by barbagli and kulkarni whereas the in lay technique is also known as the asopas technique and ventrally also you can place an uh, on lay graft like here in this case uh, this is a barbagli uh, bulb buccal mucosal graft urethroplasty where the graft is actually placed dorsally what is the difference between the barbagli repair and kolkarni repair in barbagli repair the entire urethra is actually mobilized by on both sides on the right side on the left side it is actually lifted from the bed and a graft is placed exactly in the midline and then the urethra is again repaired over it on the contrary he, 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 uh, like in this case this is a, a kolkarni technique where the mobilization is actually done only on one side you see in this case the urethra is open by, uh, by uh, on the by mobilizing it only on one side and then the graft is placed by the side here this in this case it is a uh, inner prepucial graft which was placed and then subsequently the urethra was turned over and repaired so this is also a dorsal technique dorsal only technique but however the mobilization is done only on one side 
And coming to the buccal mucosal graft, like in this case, you can see same technique. It is done on dorsolaterally on one side. The buccal mucosal graft is done. Uh, uh, the Kolkarni's technique, where the mobilization is on one side, just a, this is a small clip of video to show how the urethra can move actually. Like you see, actually the urethra is up to this level. So when once we mobilized it, uh, the urethra completely turns on to the opposite side. And then you can place the graft only on one side. And you can even clearly see the bleeding which is coming from the bed. These are all the perforating branches which uh, uh, come supplying from the uh, bed. And uh, obviously, if you mobilize it on both sides, there is a theoretical risk of decreased vascularity to the urethra. That's why the mobilization is considered only on one side in case of Kolkarnish technique. And uh, coming to the asopa, this is it's called actually dorsal inlay. Uh, graft urethroplasty is nothing but asopa where the if you see in these pictures in the left picture the urethra was first opened it is narrow then a space is created a midline incision is given and the, uh, uh, the bed is created for placing the graft here so this elliptical area which is bed is created where the buccal mucosal graft was placed and then subsequently the again the urethra is closed so the disadvantage here is you are actually opening the urethra twice one on the ventrally again you have opened and you have opened the dorsally also you have given an incision so uh, the that is and it takes a quite long time and the bleeding would be more uh, when compared to a dorsal uh, technique so uh, this is one technique this is called asopas technique uh, here in this case you see the how the urethra actually the space is you can create a good amount of space wide space and you can place a graft dorsally here inner prepucial graft was placed and then the over a catheter, the edges are bleeding. And you can see the bleeding, which is always I am telling about that all the urethral margins, wherever it is, it should bleed. And uh, ventral only technique, particularly this technique is used for bulbar urethral structures. We already discussed in the anatomy that the bulbar urethra, where the ventrally, the spongiosa is very thick. So that can be made use of putting a graft there. And in this case, you can see dorsally, they have placed a graft and ventrally, uh, the another graft is placed and which was actually sutured to the sponges or tissue. So this will get blood supply from the sponges tissue. This advantage and luxury is there only for the uh, proximal bulbar urethra. However, the same thing cannot be done in a pendular urethra. So this is ventral only buccal mucosal graft urethroplasty. Since in this case, two grafts are placed, it is also called double face uh, or parliamentary technique of uh, uh, doing uh, the uh, repair. Other thing which the residents many a times ask is what is meant by augmented anastomotic urethroplasty. So here both are there, augmented the graft because of using the graft you are augmenting the urethra and at the same time you are doing anastomosis also. Like in this picture, this is classically done for bulbar urethral structure like in this case here you see it is a long segment structure but it is not very long uh, like for 7-8 centimeters, just hardly uh, 3 to 4 centimeters. For a 1 to 2 centimeter structure in this location, obviously the first option we will consider is the end to end urethroplasty. But here the structure is still longer because if I spatulate this urethra further and proximal and distally, the urethra, the repair segment will become 5 to 6 centimeters. So you can't anastomose a 5 to 6 centimeter bit. So in such a scenarios, if there is partially lumen is available in that, then you can just excise that complete obliterated uh, segment and put a graft dorsally and ventrally you can directly anastomose. So this is called you are augmenting on the dorsally whereas ventrally you are anastomosing. So this is augmented anastomotic urethroplasty. Then comes, so so far I covered the free flaps, then comes- the, I think uh, Dr. Sudhir, we have to be quick and then we yes, have sir. to conclude. The final thing is the flaps, uh, the Orande flap, Mechanin's flap and Q flap. And the sometimes you can even create an entire tubularized flaps also can be done by using local tissues. Uh, this is a picture showing the inner prepucial tube, uh, which has been used for reconstructing the bulbar urethral necrosis or the loss which happened because a long segment complete obliteration. And complex structures, yes, in the, those are where you have extensive scarring, fistulization. These cases uh, undergo staged approach, uh, which is called the Johansson's approach. You lay open the urethra and then later on you tubularize them after placing a graft. Uh, uh, that is what it is. And then the post-operative care, yes, obviously there are some uh, when you do a major reconstruction, sometimes we even uh, inhibit the erections in the post-operative period, immediate post operative because uh, patients do have more pain on erection. So that is generally sometimes done and it is not a standard protocol everywhere. And then dressings are, of course, uh, when to do a, a pericat or you, is it mandatory or not? It's an institutional policy base. Uh, if you are confident that your repair is fine, there is no need for uh, doing a pericat or you. But in selected cases, if you have doubt or a complex repair, you can do a pericat or you. 
and then after 3 weeks till 3 weeks the catheter will be there and then at 3 weeks uh, the catheters are removed one by one uh, like in this case it's a ppu where a peri fracture urethral design where the pericat rg was done to uh, uh, look for any leakage or not also and how do you follow these cases all these patients when once all the catheters are removed uh the there is no defined protocol everywhere every institute or personal preference people follow in different way like uh, what we follow is after all catheters are removed we call them after two weeks and we ask for any decrease in urinary flow if there is any symptomatic uh, worsening if it is not so then we will not do anything and just do a uh, uh, uroflowmetry only when the patient complains that his flow is getting decreased and so after two weeks then four weeks and then subsequently in the first one year we call for up to 3 months 6 months and then every yearly you will call and if the urethral structure is stabilized for one year generally you don't have a, a recurrence uh, so soon thank you uh, yeah. thank you dr sudhir i think uh, yeah. very comprehensively covering the topic different areas uh, you have initially told yes this is a difficult topic at the same time we have tried to touch all practical points in etiology and management and how to evaluate such cases to dr amit goes so i think now somebody will present the case uh, dr amit who has prepared the case uh, demangshu uh, yes professor sarkar is going to present the case and, and uh, uh, dr singh dr devana dr uh, sarkar both will be there amit and myself also will be there and there are two students who are identified and they will be primarily answering and how we go about is that uh, we ask the question to them like how we ask in exam exam going questions uh, dr s k singh probably has taken exam for many years in almost every university and uh, national board so he is very much uh, accustomed to what is to be asked and what is not to be asked so that is what practice we want to give to the students that's yes. it so let us start <laughs> is aditya parik and jay makhadia are the two students today right evening sir where is jay sir yeah yeah aditya so... can see where is jay it's good evening can you see my uh, slides yeah we can see the slides um i thank uh, dr sabni dr ghosh and prof singh for giving me the opportunity in europe with the classes it will be a uh, exam oriented class and i'll straight go into the uh, say a 30 years old male he had a history of road traffic accidents 3 months back so was managed conservatively in a tertiary care center was put on bed rest for 8 weeks spt was spc was done and he came to the urology opd After three months, uh, the question to Dr. Joy. Joy, I think he uh, has not joined. If our team, okay. yeah, please check if, whether Joy is there because he had joined in the beginning. So meanwhile, you can put it to Dr. Adit. Yeah, Dr. Adit. Sir, so he is connected. I'll just talk to him. No problem. Yes, sir. So Adit can answer. Okay, Adit, so. Uh, looking at this history what are the other things you want to know from me or from the patient regarding the initial injuries uh, sir i would like to know what was the mode of uh, road traffic accident uh, what vehicle he was riding uh, how he was hit whether it was a head on injury whether he was hit from the side uh, at that time whether he sustained uh, whether he uh, remained conscious uh, after uh, that whether Uh, he had a sensation to pass urine whether there was any blood coming out from his neatus uh, whether he had to undergo any other surgical procedures during the course of the initial stay in the hospital uh, and whether a perurethral catheterization was attempted and it had failed whether uh, uh, he was uh, uh, he was hemodynamically stable received blood transfusions uh, and okay. uh, Yes, uh, he was riding a cycle when he was hit by a, another motorcycle, so he fell. He was taken to an emergency in a tertiary care hospital. Uh, according to him, he could not pass urine, and a catheterization was tried at that time, which failed. For which he was, uh, STC was done on this patient. There were some other injuries for which he was put on 
read this for eight weeks. Okay. He does not give any history of passing any urine for urethra since that incident. Anything else you want to know? Uh, what is his current state of mobility? Whether he is able to walk around, um, uh, whether he is able to carry out his daily functions uh, normally, or he needs support to walk. No, he can walk normally. Whether he is getting any sensation in between, whether he is clamping the SPC or the SPC is on continuous drainage. No, no, it's on continuous drainage. Okay. What is in your mind regarding the diagnosis in this patient? What happened to him in the initial injury? Why do you think so? Uh, so, uh, sir, in the initial injury, he may have uh, sustained a pelvic uh, uh, fracture as a result of which, which is indicated by the fact that he was on bed rest for eight weeks. Um, he, during that pelvic uh, fracture, he may have uh, sustained a urethral injury, uh, which prevented him from passing urine. And uh, which also, uh, the fact that perirethral catheterization was not possible at that time, uh, it may be indicative of the fact that uh, it may have been uh, a, a, tr a transactional transaction injury, which uh, did not allow that uh, catheter to be placed. And also the fact that he's not able to pass any urine perirethrally uh, at the moment also is suggestive of the fact that it may be uh, quite a... Uh, significant uh, stenosis that has ha uh, no, happened. One because question, of one question, Dr. Aditya. Uh, uh, do you agree or you would have managed in the same way when if you had seen him in the at the time of fracture that attempt the catheter, if not go, if doesn't go, then put a suprabic. Is that the way you also would have done the same way or you had some different idea of managing? Uh, sir, if uh, he, whether he required, uh, whether he was hemodynamically stable at the time, if he was hemodynamically he stable, stable. He only had uh, uh, blood in the meatus, not able to pass urine, bladder was full, you had examined, no other uh, problem, no other abdominal organ injury. So how you would have treated him? If you had, if so you sir, had... then I would have attempted a retrograde urethrogram at that time uh, to see if uh, uh, there is a, a possibility of uh, doing a primary realignment uh, so that uh, we would be able to pass a perirethral catheter uh, because primary realignment, uh, it, it will result in a, a lesser uh, complex. Uh, so th there will be uh, at least some uh, patency that is uh, maintained which will make the subsequent then, repair. Then uh, all the pros and cons yeah. of uh, doing urethrogram and then pros and cons of primary realignment. So uh, the uh, pros of doing a urethrogram are that it gives us an idea of the extent of urethral injury at that time. Uh, it, uh, it will help us determine if primary realignment is possible in the patient or not. And uh, uh, the disadvantage is that the patient may have some extravasation um, of the contrast if there is severe injury, which may uh, lead to infection uh, or intravasation of the contrast. Uh, and the, uh, prime, the uh, pros of doing a, a primary realignment are that uh, eventually the prime, the eventual repair becomes easier uh, the urethra, because the urethra remains aligned. Sometimes when primary realignment is not done, the uh, distance between the uh, proximal and distal end of the defect is uh, is more, which uh, makes the subsequent repair more difficult. However, uh, the disadvantage may be that uh, uh, sometimes primary realignment uh, may fail and in fact uh, worsen the uh, 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 distraction uh, defect. Why will it worsen? Sir, because at that time there will be manipulation and it may convert a partial uh, injury into a complete injury. No, but partial injury, if it is there, are you going to do primary realignment? It is already aligned, no? If it is, it is partial aligned. Injury. So why would you uh, say that it will worsen? That is a that is a cons of it. Uh, sir, I don't know. Okay. Mm, so at, the, at this point of time, maybe the examiner may ask you, the type of urethral injury in cases of pelvic fracture uh, urethral injury. Uh, so you have to know the classification so that accordingly the management has to be done, right? So okay. that you can judge only when you have done the program. Okay. So, Doctor, and again, again, primary alignment, 
uh, you may not say that yes, it's essential for every case, but there is a high riding prostate. Patient has become stable, has been resuscitated. It can, it can be done endoscopic primary alignment rather than blindly or by doing surgery role detecting. That should not be followed. Yes. So that you have to remember when you are applying. So you should not do damage, any further damage. That's why by yes. this primary alignment and catheterization or by rail loading technique, that should be again endoscopic alignment. And it can be done after two or three days in certain indications. Not every yes. time you should say this early management is controversial. But there are situations where you would like to do primary alignment that you should know and you should remember. Yes. So, uh, what are the other things other than this erythral injury you should look for in a Emergency retrograde erythrography. Uh, sir, whether he has a full bladder, whether there is a perineal hematoma, uh, no, whether on, on, on RGU, RGU finding. So that you don't things. see on RGU. Okay. Hematoma you okay. see. Okay. On sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. On RGU, on RGU, we would like to see uh, because we'll be taking an X-ray. So uh, the uh, whether there, what fracture is there? Um, uh, we would like to see. Uh, like the pubic rami, uh, we would like to see. We would like to see the level of the bladder neck uh, in uh, such cases, uh, whether the bladder neck is elevated as such that the high riding prostate uh, uh, may result because of that. Why do you want to know the type of fracture? You are a neurologist. Uh, You know what type of erectile injury or other vascular injuries or neurologic injuries associated with which type of uh, pelvic fracture? So yeah, actually, so what you are supposed to know is the type of pelvic fracture classification, like Tice classification, there are so many. So you that has been seen to be somewhat associated with the type of injury so that you can again answer, okay, this is the expected likely injury, but that has to be proven by retrograde urethral. Okay. And when there is a content bladder injury and the patient is not, uh, again, uh, in, not in shock, so what makes you judge whether the patient has got blood, can content bladder injury also or not? So that may be another question to you. Because dye has not gone to the bladder, now you are suspecting that because usually when the patient has isolated uterine injury or the patient has been resuscitated well, has never been in hypertension for a long time, then patient bladder is likely to be filled up. You should not be in a hurry. You should not be in a hurry to do anything. If the patient starts, okay, he cannot void, and the bladder is full, which can be assessed by imaging technique, means ultrasound, that can, can come at handy. Right? So you can, you should know it, because there is no hurry for management of urethral injury. That's why the patient life is important. You have to take every step very meticulously. You should not do add. You should not add further to the damage which the patient has already inflicted with the injury. Yes. And what Doctor Sarkar has asked is a very common question asked in exam. What answer you have to give is that why you want to know that uh, what type of fracture it is. You are not an orthopedic surgeon. You are a urologist. How ortho, how this fracture is concerned about you is because the type of fracture which you see on the X-ray will give you the idea as to what sort of injury he is likely to have. If it is a just crack fracture in the superior inferior ramus or just a, a simple crack, you don't expect too much of a distraction and too much of a other problem. As against to a fracture where there is a complete distraction of the, uh, of the uh, pubic and this rami, then very likely that it is complete uh, uh, disalignment of the urethra is likely to be there Prostatic urethra may be somewhere else. This urethra may be there. The other thing is that whether there is any hanging uh, uh, bony fragment is there or not. If there is a separate bony fragment which is there, then very likely that uh, this may have repercussion in your subsequent repair. That this bony fragment may create problem. This bony fragment can cause perforation of the uh, injury to the bladder neck or to the bladder. Uh, bladder. So concomitant bladder injury also is very likely. And over a period of time, when the callus develops, this bony separate fragment may create subsequent problem while uh, you are mobilizing the proximal urethra and uh, mobilizing the distal urethra. So that is the answer which you give to a question which is asked in the exam. Okay. And I would like to add one. 
you should know which is stable fracture, which is unstable fracture. Unstable fracture requires fixation by orthopedics. So how do you find out whether it is stable or unstable? Uh, sir, based on uh, the uh, X-ray, the gait of the patient by uh, lateral no, compression. So emergency, you are not going to tell him to walk. Walk, yeah, you can't, you can't. So, so then, sir, by uh, lateral compressions over the... Uh, so what uh, is the name? It, what do you call it? Lateral compression. There is a proper name for that. Yes, sir. Actually, you must know if you are seeing the X-ray pelvis, say whether the sacroiliac joint, yes. that's the important point, it should remain aligned, it should not get unstable. If it moves, then the, the again the fracture will move. Sometimes you can see butterfly fracture. Yeah. Now yes. both the wings, that fragment can move. Sometimes you can see open book fracture. So these are the terms sometimes the people may not like to know, but yes, maybe but you should not hesitate if you don't know. But yes, you must yeah. know what is stable and unstable. If fracture. the sacroiliac joint is uh, is fractured and if it is uh, not aligned, it is very likely that it is an unstable fracture. Otherwise, pubic symphysis, you know that even if there is a distraction and is that, the gait will not be affected. It is not a stable, uh, it is not an unstable thing. That's right. Yes. Do you know any classifications related to RGU, which is done in the emergency setting? Yeah, I have told. I have also classified. The McCullum Calipinto uh, classification is there, sir. Okay. Uh, that is grade one. Is anything, the, any, any other? Uh, uh, Mechanics. One, one is Goldman oh, classification. Sorry, sir. One is Goldman classification and another is uh, McCullum and uh, McCullum classification. Calipinto classification. So you have to, uh, I mean, you can read that anyway. That is generally you have to know how to interpret the severity of injury based on the RGU. Yes, sir. Correct. So, uh, any, anything which prompts you to, for emergency management? Uh, so the, presence of, the presence of a bony uh, fra uh, fragment at the bladder neck or a intravesical perforation of the bladder. Uh, or when uh, some, when uh, uh, the patient is being taken up for a pelvic surgery uh, and uh, the patient has a concomitant bladder neck injury, uh, these patients can be taken up uh, can be uh, taken up for emergency management of uh, the uh, urethral injury. Okay. So, what next uh, important negative history you want to ask in this case? Uh, sir, here I want to know about uh, the uh, whether the patient's fam the patient is married or not. Uh, what is uh, uh, I mean whether his family is complete or not? Whether he's getting erections at the moment? Uh, uh, whether he's able to have intercourse? Uh, what, whether he's getting nocturnal uh, in, uh, erections or early morning erections? Whether he's getting them or not? Uh, and uh, Right now, whether he's able to walk walk around, whether he's able to perform routine activities, whether he's able to squat or not. Okay, what else you want to ask? Uh, Anything else you want to ask? What else? If you have a suprabic catheter for three months, what else you want to ask? Whether he has had any infections during, has he, I mean, he has any fever during these uh, three months? Uh, how many times he has changed the uh, suprabic during these three months? Okay, what else? Uh, we know that it, is, it has been on an open drainage, so uh, yeah. we, uh, we have to evaluate whether he is getting sensation or not by clamping the suprabic. Uh, catheter mm -hmm. and uh, what is important is that how comfortable he is with suprabic catheter whether he is getting any uh, uh, bladder irritative symptoms because of the suprabic catheter why it is important uh, sir in the uh, post operative course he will so post continue to not post operative uh, beforehand the send has come to you at 3 months because 
if he has got a severe catheter symptoms, he is not tolerating, he has got pain, he has got uh, uh, pain at the tip of the penis, he is touching the uh, catheter on the trigone and this, you know that this suprabibic site may so not be a proper not site. Proper site, yes. You know, so that is very important. So Aditya, if I call into emergency mm -hmm. for a patient of suspected TSE wife, and uh, you do not have uh, RG facility or you don't want to do RG facility or planning for SPC. Tell me the uh, proper site of an SPC in a patient of TFUI. Uh, sir, in a patient of TFUI, I would like to do uh, the SPC 5 centimeters above the pubic symphysis, a slightly higher SPC compared to what we would routinely do because this would help me in my, my subsequent uh, management where, where before planning a definitive repair, I would want to do a suprabibic scopy along with a cystoscopy um, uh, uh, to in my planning. So at that time, if the suprabibic is placed slightly high, it makes it easier to negotiate the uh, flexible scope uh, or the uh, uh, bougie into the you know, urethra if uh, because the angle is lesser. Anything else other than this manipulation during the uh, surgery? Anything related to orthopedics, bone injury? So when they would want to operate, also uh, for uh, they they perform lower incisions. So the superbubic would be away from our site of uh, from their site of incision. So that is so now uh, come to this. Uh, patient proper, the patient is in front of you, what are the things you should ask at present, what are the things you should look and what are the things you should feel in this patient so before you do an investigation? In short, what will you see on examination? He is there in front uh, of you, you have asked whatever history you wanted to ask, so how will you carry out your examination? Uh, important findings, you just narrate. So, Let me uh, tell you what so, things are there, whatever you want to yes, ask. Yes, sir. So on examination, I would... Uh, First, like to uh, begin with general examination of the patient, um, look for uh, his vital signs, his general uh, well-being. Uh, the uh, I would like to look for pallor if because he had undergone uh, he he had a pelvic fracture which uh, required him to be on bed rest. So I'd look uh, like to look for pallor specifically in general examination. Uh, whether uh, look uh, check for his vitals on uh, specific uh, local examination. I would like to begin with the per abdomen examination. Palpit is abdomen. Uh, look for the site of SPC. Uh, the uh, and then proceed to a local examination where uh, I would like to also observe his gait, how he's able to walk, whether he's able. To, I would like to make him squat uh, and see if he's able to squat or not. In local examination, I would like to uh, examine his uh, glands, check the glands for uh, gland sensation, uh, glands warmth, color of glands. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, palpate the perineum and uh, uh, look for any signs of uh, hematoma, uh, uh, look for uh, any uh, uh, local uh, injury at that site. And uh, uh, I think that's it. So the question is what you should ask should be relevant to this, question, this uh, patient. And uh, in sir, that I, case, you have just, yeah. Anybody? anybody? Sir, I would like to ask. Ask about. Actually, uh, you have to look uh, for something. You have to feel something. So he has pointed out the because the examiner is focusing on this thing because time is short. So he's very focused yes. and he wants to know from you. See, so I will ask uh, whether uh, he's had any passage of urine from below. Uh, whether he's getting uh, proper erections at the moment or not, and uh, 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 whether uh, and about the family history, his family history, whether his family is complete, whether he's married. And uh, I would also, I would look for local uh, uh, areas to, uh, I also look at his buccal mucosa in case we require to uh, use additional tissue uh, to augment the, uh, this thing and uh, look at the local, uh, local site to palpate. And then I would like to palpate the local perineum and look for the site of SPC. Actually, when you have saw that buccal fracture, uh, yeah, in urethral injury. In those cases, I think uh, the other relevant point would be like, yes, how he has bowel motion has been because he has fracture. So that can lead to neurogenic bladder. And then you have to see whether his bowel habit has altered or sometime there can be fracture to the sacrum. 
that you are not aware yeah. of. But yes, if you ask, these are relevant questions. Will certainly raise your level. So just say, as a, as a, again, a, one small query you can have. Now, second, the when the catheter block, as Dr. Sudhir has told you, is it that he has some problem? Does he leak anything from rectum? So that will tell you what any injury to the rectum also associated. What again you should look for is SPC site that has been Dr. Devans who has been asking to you, where you would like to put the SPC. Now you have to look for. Now what you feel, what you have to feel, you have just feel the site of the whether the prostate is at the normal location or not. Yes. Now, do you feel any specula bone? Anything coming on the way to pro proceed for progressive penetroplasty? So that's also important. Then, what do you feel? I already have told you, glance. The temperature, yes. warmth, and everything. Right. And the urethra, and along the urethra, and the urethra. If the patient has got any history of attempted catheterization or something. Right. So this patient gives history of no erection since the injury. is married. Uh, without any children, local examination, SPC is very low down. Perineal examination does not reveal any scar or any bone spicule. Theory is normal. Why do you think, what are the mechanisms by which this patient might have got post-injury importance? So that's um, So sir, in uh, uh, this, there are three possibilities that uh, I would like to put first is uh, vasculogenic, neurogenic or psychogenic. Vasculogenic uh, because there may be injury to the vasculature uh, supplying the penis which is the, which is, comes from the internal pudendal artery. Uh, there is a possibility that he may have had injury to the, uh, because he has had injury to the pelvis, it may have uh, damaged the nerve supply, nerves that are supplying the uh, penis that is the cavernosal nerves. And also because of trauma and injury, uh, many patients are in a period of shock where they are not, uh, they, they, he may also have psychogenic ED because he may not have had the inclination for uh, performing sexual intercourse. So uh, these, these would be the possibilities in this patient. Which one is the most common uh, of all these? Like you said, vasculogenic, neurogenic, psychogenic. Sir, vasculogenic ED. Uh, which one is most the common? most which common is neurogenic, sir. In, yeah. in, in neurogenic uh, is common. Right. Why do you say though? Uh, sir, because uh, in uh, the, the nerves that are supplying the uh, pelvis, they uh, the the penis, they run close to the uh, pelvic bone, and uh, with a history of pelvic trauma, uh, there is a chance that the nerves may have been damaged. So in PFUI, particularly neurogenic, uh, it is uh, more common. So now, so like in this case, like in this case, he doesn't have erections now. So how will uh, how will you proceed then? What I you want will, to I will. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, check because you don't know, no? It could be psychogenic also. I am saying it is yes, psychogenic. So, so how to rule it out? Yes, sir. So we should do uh, an office retinal field test. Uh, and uh, when he check. has no erection, what Doctor Devana is asking. When he has no erection, have you asked and compared his erection before uh, injury or not? He may be having uh, uh, erection problem even before also, whether it is same or not. So that is the first thing, yes. that whether these erections have gone after trauma, whether he was all right before, whether there is any uh, significant difference, what is the significant difference? So that is what you must ask first. Okay. okay. Now, having said that, he was perfectly all right before. And so how will you proceed? That's what asking. Uh, sir, we'll uh, uh, we'll perform uh, the we'll first ask him whether he's having any uh, morning erections. If not, then we will proceed with an office children of test, uh, which will uh, tell us whether uh, if he does develop erections on office children of test, then it is uh, quite possible that he may have uh, uh, some organic cause and. Uh, uh, which we would then like to uh, organic if he has on office written a fill, if he has got good erection, then you, you say that it is organic cause. Uh, How do you say that? Aditya, just revise. Yes, sir. Uh, 
no sir then it is more likely that he had uh, a psychogenic cause i'm i uh, I said it the other supposing, way. Supposing, supposing if he doesn't have erections even on children, I feel them. Uh, sir, then it is uh, quite possible that he may have an organic cause of uh, the. So what to uh, do? Dysfunction. So, so what next? What next? You do any other any other test to. Uh, get, get the erections or not? How will you evaluate Sir, them? We uh, commonly perform the intracavernosal injections uh, to see that if uh, on intracavernosal injection whether he what gets injection? the what injection? Uh, what is the drug that is bimix? So we can give bimix or trimix, uh, which is uh, basically chlorpheniramine and uh, papaverin or fentolamine, either depending on the. Uh, so, Dr. Aditya uh, here, I will like to interfere. See, examiner is not asking you the ways of assessing the penile erection due to injection. You have to be very particular because he is assessing your pet care knowledge. What you have been doing, make only one point that I will inject this. Okay, if he asks you, are there any other method or any other agent to be injected? I think this is a very important point which uh, most of the students make mistake. This is not theory. This is a specific to the uh, patient. So you don't say these are the options 1, 2, 3, 4, I will do anything of this. What will you do in this case? That is what is important. Theory is over. So what will you do in this case? Which combination you will use? The chlorpheniramine uh, and uh, papaverin. Uh, chlorpromazine and papaverin. Chlorpromazine, sorry. Chlor chlorpromazine and uh, uh, papaverin combination. And we'll check whether he is uh, getting uh, erections or not. Uh, only the erection or you check? Or you would like to see some of the turgidity of the, We would like to check for erections, the rigidity of erection, the turgidity of the glands. Uh, but would you like to take this opportunity to evaluate the cavernosal artery and the other things also? Would you like to do Doppler? <coughs> so now you should yes. say yes when you are because you don't want to inject again yes. the the material again and again. So you should tell yes, I would like to do the again Doppler study in this case. Okay. If patient has the yeah. erection, you have to have some objective assessment. Yes, and yes. then you can use that one for assessing the urethral artery. What is that? And then the doctor, they can tell you what happens to the bulbar artery. And usually they will say cavernosal artery. What is, why it is important? It has any association with uh, erectile dysfunction, with the urethral injury, with the outcome of the urethroplasty? Uh, sir, uh, if, uh, because the blood supply of the uh, urethra may be uh, compromised as a result of pelvic injury, uh, whether the patient has erections or not is a surrogate marker of the vascularity of uh, the uh, urethra, which is uh, which will determine uh, whether uh, our repair will be successful or not. Also, the patient we should be uh, thoroughly counseled preoperatively that if he is not having erections now, then subsequently also after our surgery, uh, he is not likely to regain the erection. Uh, which which should be made uh, clear in the counselling of the patient. You have to Are you very, sure very that guarded, the... guarded, guarded, yes. You have to be very guarded prognosis. You should not disappoint them. But yes. same time, yes, certainly, if both are there, the patient has got, again, cold, clammy, again, glands, cold uh, uh, glands, and then not turgidity glands and not warm glands. At the same time, the patient has no erection. Uh, then, yes, you have to see the site of fracture. Maybe it may be a case of injury to the internal potential artery. Right. Again, yes, so how will you how will you evaluate in this case? Because we don't have much time. Right, sir. So, so, so with this is a case in front of you. You have got everything in all information, examination, everything is told to you. So how will you proceed from here on? So I would like to now uh, subsequently first uh, do, do a urine routine microscopic uh, urine culture, uh, uh, rule out the infection and uh, perform a specific investigation of a um, micturating cystourethrogram with a retrograde and, uh, urethrogram, which is an up-downogram up uh, or a choke film, 
to see uh, what is the extent of uh, the distraction defect uh, in this procedure we first perform a retrograde erythrogram fill the bladder with the superbubic catheter um, and so uh, you can so i just want to interrupt a small point here based on this history and examination without investigation uh, what 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 is the problem that he is having what type of what diagnosis you are going to it is clearly only pelvic fracture urethral injury only or it could be anything else it could be any is there any other possibility based on the history and examination so far there is no doubt that it is the other the the other uh, possibility is that because he has not been evaluated so far uh, and he has been on an spc right from beginning uh, he and we have not even tested with the clamping of suprabubic whether he is getting sensation he is able say, to pass let's say no urine not. is no urine no drops are coming on clamping the spc i am giving that still then what possibilities are there so then uh, because of uh, the history of pelvic trauma a neurogenic bladder uh, would be one uh, uh one cause where uh, the, he may have had some sacral fracture and he is not uh, injury to the nerves uh but in that case that in that case in that case uh, when you clamp the spc at least uh, even if he has neurogenic bladder if the bladder is too much full at least some drops of urine will, will come yes sir you think he has, got a, have... he has got ruptured urethra as well as neurogenic bladder both you want to say no no sir my uh, first impression is uh, pelvic fracture urethral injury uh, any other any other possibility can can it bladder be bladder neck a... bladder neck contracture yeah. bladder neck contracture and, and, okay any other possibility can it be just a straddle urethral injury to the bulbar urethra leading to complete occlusion of the only bulbar i am talking about anterior urethral stricture involving bulbar yes sir yes sir it can be so that, that also could be there right because we don't know the exact mode of injury so straight to the perineum yes, we can have that also so still yes, now we, we have the possibilities anyway okay now on investigation you will anyway eliminate one by one and go ahead yes sir so the first i would like to perform a, a retrograde uh, urethrogram uh, to look for the site of uh, where the uh, patient has uh, either the stricture the stenosis of the injury uh, followed by which uh, i would like to perform a maturating cyst urethrogram uh and see the, the uh, extent of uh, injury uh, or distraction defect that is that uh, one can make out if it is a pelvic fracture or injury on the mcu i would like to uh, see the level of the bladder neck whether the bladder neck is opening up adequately or not and uh, whether the posterior urethra is filling up to what level um, and uh, uh, i would also like to along with that look at the bony uh skeleton of the patient to uh, see if the fractures that he previously had have uh, healed well or not this is a very basic question what is the yes. position when you do rgu mcu and why uh, so sir for rgu uh, the patient is uh, placed in a left side of, uh, right is turned lateral to the right side with his uh, right leg uh, flexed at the hip Uh, in such a manner that on stretching the penis the uh, thigh and the penis are parallel to each other and the body is rotated uh, 45 degree uh, to make sure that only one obturator foramen is properly seen so that is the the position we you for uh, this thing and for uh, mcu um, we uh, first fill the bladder in uh, the supine position followed by which uh on uh, when the patient is asked to void he is made to stand with uh, the right leg uh, uh flexed and uh, abducted uh, at the hip uh, with the uh, knee flexed and uh, pressed onto the level of the knee and the penis is pulled and taped onto the uh, and, and is taped onto the thigh and the patient is asked to void uh, with his uh upper upper arms uh, behind his uh, head uh what will happen if i take a 90 degree lateral view or a 0 degree ap view what will happen in our view why do to take so much of pain to make it 45 degree sir uh, very often the uh, bulbar urethra uh, because because of the uh, curvature of the bulbar urethra uh, we will not be there be uh, a false uh, 
uh, impression of narrowing that is seen at the level of the uh, bulbar urethra if the uh, this thing is not properly given because of the curvature and the, if the penis is not stretched properly dr aditya what uh, actually doc uh, when you are being asked like this you know why you are making the position change there should not be overlap bone is also radio opaque so you should have a clear vision right and then you can check in fluoroscopy whether the urethra yes. when you are doing rg or mcu if there no overlap you should not presume and bones should not overlap it and then you should have a clear vision yes sir. and patient should be in a comfortable position some a table is meant patient can make can be made erect for body uh, but same when you are doing combined then you have to acquire a different position so that will look convenient and uh, certainly you should put the penis stretched so that there not should be kink but actually that is more important when you think of anterior urethral structure yes right okay so the mcu and rgu so are you aware of any so examiner may ask you what is the gapometry and something like that that times you yes, should sir. remember that yeah yes, now sir. yeah this the is the gapometry is seen on mr no, actually i am not asking you now yeah, so this is the x ray now uh, that yeah. is uh, yeah correct yeah. yes. tell the findings and uh, what is your opinion uh so on x ray the uh the bladder neck is uh, seen to open well uh, the anterior urethra does not show uh, any uh, narrowing at except at the penoscrotal junction uh, the bulbar urethra is well opacified uh, up to the proximal urethra and uh, the uh, posterior urethra part about a part of the posterior urethra is also well opacified on uh, this so there it seems like a, a distraction defect in the level of the uh, membranous urethra and a part of the prostatic urethra so how do you say this structure is prostato membranous or it's a bulbo membranous i see you say it is a prostatic urethra is involved no it is not involved i'm saying that in that region of prostatic urethra sir it is uh... so you think prostatic urethra is normal or it is abnormal so now you know the age of the patient what do you expect the size of the prostate of this person so that you can imagine what has happened yes. how much do you expect the length of the prostatic urethra so he is young when... Yes, he is a young male. Thirty years. Uh, he is a thirty-year-old. Thirty-year-old. Yeah, thirty years. Yeah, Tall is thirty. You must yes. remember all these points in a chronological order so that you do not forget it when you are replying. Okay. Because say, is a patient given to you? This is by luck. This patient has come to you. And the what yes. examiner intends to see whether this person, if this person comes to this doctor or this urologist, can he treat him? Basically, has he got yes. develop a good concept? He may not be an expert, but does he know? Has he got the basic training to evaluate and to progress, uh, to assess this person? Does he know the how to proceed for a given case? So that is the idea of the examiner, right? So now in this case, what do you say now? The when you see the cystogram, the filling phase, you see posterior urethra is seen. Now say when you have taken the MCU combined RG and MCU, you see posterior urethra is seen. Does it say that it is patient going to be incontinent? Falling with the blood. His bladder, his bladder neck is well preserved, and uh, which is why I he would he is likely to remain continent after uh, our intervention. However, but on filling, but on filling phase, the bladder. bladder neck got open. Yes, this is the full bladder and the bladder ideally it should not open, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, that good. Okay, yes. Are you happy with this pill? Full so, bladder, bladder neck is so open. Or bladder neck is incompetent. Bladder neck is incompetent, yes, sir. How do you say that? So because on filling phase, uh, this is not actually this is the uh, full bladder uh, cystogram film on which the bladder neck has opened up to the level that is seen again on the double ogram when the patient has been asked to void and we have injected contrast from below. uh so uh, he may and the membranous urethra is also uh, 
not seen in uh, this film so so you are suspecting blood and right incompetence how do you confirm that that is that it change your uh, management or you just ignore it forget it us mein kaun se badi baat so the blood and right incompetence will uh, I say, I say chance. that the, when we are filling the bladder, actually, patient had a, got a sudden urge and he has just opened his posterior, th- his bladder neck. That's why this film has come up like this. Yes, sir. So how do you That's confirm? True. In short, when you see such picture, how do you confirm that there is a bladder neck competence is there or it is incompetent? You have to have some confirmation, no? As uh, Dr. Devanna says. that with the with the small capacity bladder may have or you have filled up you are filling up yes or he is passing his training he has a severe uh, over activity of the bladder he is he is contracting the bladder how do you confirm what next we are going to do so uh, now not necessarily next would be to perform a suprapubic uh, uh, So, suprapubic and uh, a cystoscopy and a suprapubic scopy. Uh, when we perform that, uh, also we would be able to uh, make out whether uh, when our scope is in the bladder and we are filling the bladder, whether the bladder neck is opening up or not, or whether it is uh, remaining uh, closed. What is the specific things you should look at bladder neck to predict that this patient has a bladder neck injury or this is a normal bladder? What is the specific things you look for in antigen scope? How does a normal bladder neck looks in antigen? So when the uh, when the examiner is asking such question, what you are going to look into, a uh, look for when you are doing scopy through the suprapubic tract. So now you must see whether there is any fragment of stone, actually any incrustations material is there, any stone is there in the bladder or not that you must see, and then you see how the bladder neck looking. It is circular. or is there any scarring and looking not looking circular yes so if there is scarring to the bladder neck the shape will be different now when you empty the bladder then does the that the bladder neck again get approximated so this gives some rough idea but again length of the posterior thigh is also important now you must see whether you have seen the verumen tendon or not do you see beyond the verumen tendon here it looks like as if the prostate is small and the injury at the level, at the uh, uh, through the prostate or maybe at the apex of the prostate it's not yes. beyond that so maybe the sphincter is actually when the bladder patient voids the sphincter should have relaxed but many times yeah you will see though, okay there is some part of the urethra is still seen beyond and that should not be a surprise to you but in this case yeah looks to be looks appears that this is the end of the urethra prox distal end of the proximal urethra posterior urethra so you must see for the verumen tendon you see that there is no stone lying in the bladder anywhere and that is the important part of inspection and then when you are putting the rigid scope you see that yeah you have to have assessment when you are passing the buji blindly you must assess yes which direction you are going to put in yes okay well, and then inspect oh. right please and then at same time you should do calibration you must not forget to see anterior urethra through the scope because yes. you can see there is a kink here kink, in the mid yes, at the penoscotal junction so you yes. have to verify this is imaging this is not heredity don't presume that this is due to kink you have to verify that anterior urethra was normal perfectly normal when you have taken this patient for surgery for progressive peroneal urethroplasty and you must do parietal exams and if you have not done earlier how is the prostate Is it high riding? Yes. Or it is in normal location. So at least you are mentally ready. If you have to do pubectomy, how long, how big pubectomy has to be? So these are important yes. points to be assessed. So this is the patient. So what do you think? This is going to be a easy operation or difficult? What are the things you should look for to measure the gap? And what are the things you should keep in mind? To or tell that this patient is going to be easy this surgery is going to be difficult um so sir uh, for uh, identifying the distance uh, approximately the uh, distance of the pubic ramus is about 2 cm it is considered about 2 cm so uh, this is just a little more than more than that uh, 
the two two normal areas are little more than that's about three centimeter uh, of defect uh, seems like is there and uh, the other thing is that uh, we have to see whether uh, on uh, the uh, superbubic cystoscopy we are able to see the verum montanum or not and uh, here this looks like a quite a high distraction defect so uh, this is likely to be a, a difficult surgery because um, this is quite above the uh, we are above the pubic inferior pubic ramus in terms of the uh, defect as well sir. Mm -hmm. other than gap any other thing which might any other, uh, thing? Any other thing other than gaps suppose Anything you have done an anterograde scopy and you see the verru but after that is complete cut off you do a retrograde scopy and it is a complete cut off here the gap is around 3 cm what are the other things you should look for you should you should do in the initial assessment patient has been on table and then you are making an assessment under anesthesia sir so the uh, pliability of the tissue uh, has to be seen whether um, when we are doing the suprabubic scopy and going from retrograde whether we are able to see the light of uh, the the thing from above and below no there can you, you expect, expect to see light here no, sir. cannot no, sir. can't so don't utter such things okay because that is the theory part now like this you, is the real case scenario yes sir. can you feel anything like because you have an anterograde axis on table when you pass a buji from above normally when you have a small defect will you feel the buji from below yes like in the sir. perineum in the perineum yes sir, yes, sir. Uh, sometimes you might feel it uh, if it is you are yes, not sir. able to feel it that means it is above that pubic symphysis so obviously there might be a high chance of you going for inferior pubectomy it should be better or the other thing is putting a finger in your rectum and feeling the buji from below also okay. for rectal there also you can get an assessment whether it is very higher up or not okay. so these are in other adjuncts to see and uh, one more thing which you didn't you should know is the like whenever doing anterograde scopy like uh, other than the bladder neck you have to look for always whether there is any associated false passage sometimes of course in this case it's not there and uh, you have to look for uh, other uh, false passages or any uh, uh, there is a small opening lateral to the bladder neck with a cavity formation these things will be there in severe injuries yes. those are additional findings which you should look sometimes there might be a stone in the bladder because these yes. patients on spc for 3 months they are poorly maintained so some patient might have stone formation so okay. all these things you have to look into Yes, the other thing you should look for is the alignment of the uh, both the urethra. That is very important. Sometimes the urethra is posteriorly displaced or laterally displaced. In those cases are particularly difficult. The malalignment. There is no malalignment. So how do you proceed in this patient? Um, uh, sir, so after I performed uh, my anterior and retrograde uh, cystoscopy, I would like to. Uh, uh, first with the written and informed consent of the patient uh, counsel him for a progressive um, a perineal urethroplasty in uh, i would like to give the patient an extended lithotomy position uh, and uh, perform a dorsal uh, incision uh, an incision in, over the perineum uh, which is uh, what a lambda shaped what incision uh, sir uh, lambda shaped incision a uh, lambda shaped incision uh, because i'm expecting it to uh, a be high so i will need more exposure so lambda incision and uh, along with that uh, uh, i would like to proceed first with uh, uh, bulbar mobilization why not just a midline incision why not just a midline incision sir the lambda incision gives us a better exposure uh, if you extend the midline incision further also you can extra, you have wide exposure i just extend the incision further so sir uh, then uh, if we extend it why do you say yes. i will give better exposure it will give a better exposure to what what organs in what to the uh, to the perine uh, to the perine so the uh, uh, the uh, posterior uh, urethra the uh, that is in mid line that is in mid line huh. those structures are mid line So, so, one of, yeah, so one of the logic you have to say when you are making lambda, you have to make a U flap 
so that if needed, this scheme can be utilized for subsequent thoplasty if there is a failure. That you can uh, again give some logic for making a lambda incision. Otherwise, yes, people can approach with a midline incision, and the approach can be again very good, very good. That by that also, but yet there are some advantage. There are some disadvantage for both the incisions. Like you have okay. some suppose if you have an associated uh, fistula with the rectum, hmm. and you need more exposure. There you have to mobilize the rectum anterior wall of the rectum while repairing. So there the lambda there, yes, better. Their lambda would be better. Okay. And okay. the rare situation where you want to convert to perineal urethrostomy. That's right. Yes. Then you can um, take that incision. Same proceed, proceed. Okay, okay. proceed. So, what next? Uh, so then, sir, I would pass an anti-grade uh, bougie and try to feel it, uh, whether I'm able to feel it in the perineum uh, somewhere or not. Uh, uh, and the, so in progressive perineal urethroplasty, the uh, concept is to have a tension-free anastomosis. No, for which... the theory. The theory no, you follow the steps, no? you have given incision. So the first step will be... What next? So then... Uh, then the then we'll uh, cut open the uh, bulbous spongiosus muscle and uh, mobilize the bulbar urethra that is bulbar mobilization. Uh, if even with How that we are will mobilize. How far? So how far will mobilize far? the bulbar urethra? Uh, so right up to the area of the normal. No, normally, I mean, distally and proximally, you have proximally this cut off. So proximally, and we mobilize it distally so that we can we can get more length. So yeah, how far? How distally, far? how far? Like beyond beyond this point, if I mobilize further, there is a problem. What is the problem that is going to occur? So, so with uh, if we excessively mobilize distally, then there will be penile shortening, curvature of the penis uh, that can happen. So that is um, beyond the pino bulbar junction. If you go beyond yes. and if you pull it, obviously the cordy will be there. Cordy and also cordy. unnecessary excessive mobilization is also not needed because you are going to hamper the vascular. The vascularization. So, so you will anyway you know, hampering the vascularity. So how much is needed? That much only you have to do. See, Aditya, yes, and in the in a in a third year exam going, we don't expect that you are showing the any as uh, Dr. Uh, discussing told that you may not be expert but you must know the concepts so the next concept which we want to ask you is that suppose you want to approach the proximal urethra you have taken care of a distal urethra it is not a failed so what steps you will take one by one that's it one two three four that's it but don't, we don't expect anything any expertise from you yes so the bulbar mobilization be clear. corporal separation um, bulbar mobilization, corporal separation, uh, uh, re <coughs> of uh, the penis, third, and third, third step is what? Oh, re inferior, corporal pubectomy. inferior pubectomy, inferior pubectomy. Yes, usually, and people, yeah, uh, usually, people have usually people don't do re routine, that's not required. Re routine is the very last step, last step, yeah. Yes. So, you must say all these steps. And then where we'll say, where do you like to again excise? Again, uh, you are like to separate the bulbary urethra from all the spongiosa from there, from which structure? Usually the urogenital diaphragm, you dissect the bulb as much as possible, and the parutal catheterization and passing the buji to the meatus will help you where is it going to end. Yeah, where it ends, you transect there. Transect there. So that you and don't then, waste any urethra. Yes, Yes. And yeah, so you try to preserve as much as possible of the spongiosa. And then you will see, yeah, you will start cutting from the distal, the proximal, until the, because when you pass the foliage catheter, it's a preferred because it's a soft structure, not cause any injury. Maybe six different foliage catheter in this adult, or maybe 18 different foliage catheter. And then you cut beyond that. And then what when you are excited, again separating the bulbar urethra from perineal membrane or those scar area, what happens? Any complication you can expect there? So when we are, when you are separating the, uh, we may, uh, so there may be uh, bleeding from, uh, when you're doing the inferior pubectomy, 
uh, at that time no. we may i'm not talking about infer payback me when you are uh, like transacting the urethra and delivering it out at that time any complication you can expect and how can it be avoided and how or how you should be careful there to prevent that complication any other injury other than the urethra what structure can be injured rectal so yes. now the peno rectal injury yeah so eno rectal area you will see the rectum the peno actually rect, eno rectal junction that comes anteriorly and the recta enter and rect, uh, the anal canal goes posteriorly from there so if there is a severe scarring so not hesitate yeah. in again putting the again finger in the rectum before again transecting through the fibrous tissue what else what else complication anything else there may be bleeding now, most Yeah, Common. sometimes you have to be careful when you are cutting bulbar artery. Bulbar artery will get bulbar yeah, artery. That will, yeah. So that will again the blood. Invariably, the bulbar artery will uh, yes. will get transected and it will start bleeding. Yes. Yeah, and then the maybe it's going to be a bad sign. The bleeding from the bulbar artery is a good sign because it means that uh, there is the vascularity of the penis is preserved. But now yes. you are transected. Yeah. So uh, now you have transected. Eh? So whatever good was there, you have now damaged it. So now good sign you have converted to bad sign. So would you like to do? Well, actually, sometimes just to misguide the examiner, examinee, <laughs> the examiner may ask you, would you like to preserve? Are you? Would yeah. you like to do again bladder uh, again the bulbar artery preserving surgery in this case? Yeah. Would you like to do that? That's a very common question. just to know whether just you know your concept, concept. <laughs> why not because see the blood supply was so good so now he will ask you why not to preserve it would you like to do bulbar bulbar artery preservative preserving preservating urethroplasty preserving urethroplasty now try it because then you can't again bridge the gap you have to bring this bulbar to the apex yes. of the prostate here so that is not possible right but yes that shows the good blood supply is a good sign because in that case you can be assured internal pudendal artery has not been injured, injured yes. so therefore you feel the deep dorsal artery also is good going to be okay. good which will supply the but uh, the urethra retrograde that is assessment yes. can you can do. okay next next step what what to do now? after urethra is mobilized and transected what you are going to do there I think we have to be again. Uh, I mean, you can finish it off. Uh, crural yeah. separation, you have said. Another five already. ten minutes. We should. Let's finish. suppose. Let's suppose in this case, I have done crural separation, and even uh, in, uh, I am uh, I, the the I am unable to feel the bougie there. Uh, okay. Still. Then uh, uh, next step would be inferior pubectomy. Yes, so inferior pubectomy. Whenever you are doing inferior pubectomy, uh, how to prevent uh, injury to the uh, dorsal artery of penis? while doing inferior pubectomy because dorsal arteries are there are lying on that only right so uh, to aditya actually the examiner will yeah examiner will be interested in whether you have been watchful or not because surgery what surgery is you have to learn good anatomy yes then while well, you can make this, there may be some deviation anatomical abnormality that you have to assess by again fracture pelvis no what sort of yeah Whether the ischial ischial tuberosity is deviated, whether it was fractured to the ischial inferior pubic ramae or not, so then because pura remains attached to that. And this is a common question, ah, uh, that uh, when you are doing inferior pubectomy, how to prevent damage of the dorsal artery of the penis? This is a common question. Yes. Well, this is the only blood supply to the urethra after transection of yes. the bulb. Yes, sir. Do you know or not? I don't know, sir. right so in that case you have to say yeah because you have to go again you have to see where the deep dorsal artery deep dorsal vein how many deep dorsal vein are there and how many deep dorsal arteries are there so that again two, question yeah two deep dorsal vein and one deep dorsal artery no is that is the point this is the only part in the body where arteries are two in reverse, number reverse and, and vein is only one yes this is the basic concern and then another area is called again supra a uh, costal artery and vein that is another side where arteries uh, are two in number and vein is only one so that's the anatomy you have to remember so deep dorsal artery vein is the median structure 
you have to look for it before inferior pubic tone. And then if needed, you have to ligate because you have to do hemostasis maybe when you are doing pinpectomy. And then in that case now, you have to make imidroin incision on the pubic, on the periosteum. Periosteum. See, the and this important part is that periosteum, once you cut the periosteum, your dissection should be sub-periosteum. Sub-periosteum. Because the crura is not attached to the bone. Mm -hmm. All these arteries that come superficial to the periosteum. Therefore, periosteum. if you separate the periosteum, push it again laterally, arteries are also likely to get pushed laterally. So, therefore, you have to make the pubic area raw. Again, only bone will remain there and then subsequently you start nibbling. Do you know the instrument used for inferior pubectomy? What are the equipment required and what is the uh, yeah. Bone hammer hammer and jaw. Bone no, no. So, that is a separate name the, for the instrument. Yeah, so now you have to know this one, bronzer. Eh? Bronzer, then again, a bone nibbler. Have you seen ever this, uh, these, equip, these, these equipments for infrastructure? Yes, yes. So, bit by bit, you have to cut. Yeah, sometimes you will, even the periosum, say so you can use the chimbal chisel and hammer, but you have to be careful because. That direct impact will lead to fracture subsequently, and you are likely to leave some bony fragment here and there. Therefore, so you have to be very balanced. Last two, three questions, and then we'll wind up. Yeah, that's right. Sir. Right. So now you have done pepeptomy, which is oozing, and you want to have a clear again uh, field of surge, field of vision. Because the bone, cancerous bone will start bleeding. And the area always you will go on sucking, it is not clear what you will do, how will create hemostasis. This is another knowledge that with the general surgeon uh, usually so apply. Pardon? So there's a bone chalk that uh, we can apply to uh, have you, like have you ever seen it? Okay, Dr. Adit, have you ever assisted and seen what? bone yeah. wax? Bone wax. Bone, bone, bone wax. Bone wax. Bone wax. Bone wax. Chalk, bone wax. Bone wax. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Chalk means something hard. Yes, sir. Yes, which, gets bone brittle, wax. which gets brittle. Which gets brittle. Right. So, you must know all these points because these are the usually. And how does it call hemostasis? <coughs> what you do actually to the bone wax? So, you must say that this has to be taken in chip again, again on your tip of the finger, maybe index and the thumb. And you have to press inside. Press it. So it goes to the cancellous bone and cause it hemostasis so to make the vision clear. But same yeah. time, yeah, all right, okay. And uh, so after, after inferior pubectomy, suppose uh, you are able to feel the bougie now, a little yeah. bit, what? a little bit. Now what will you do next step is what? So it's you can see star, that, huh? yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, what he is trying to say that you are feeling okay, there is something like bougies, they are likely to be there. So, what is the veining in between is the scar tissue. Right. Then this was, yeah, the bone has now the hematoma and other, that area has been scarred. So, there is some tissue which you have to excise. But same time, now you have to be careful where to excise. Right. Right. So there any the Devan show any last question you want to ask? Last question is how do you locate the proximal stump? What are the methods in difficult cases? Um, so we can pass a flexible cystoscope. Uh, for, for the first and the foremost is we usually pass a uh, blind a buchi blind uh, through the suprapubic tract. The uh, other is that we can pass a flexible cystoscope and then assess the light uh, that. Uh, from below. Uh, so that is second. Anything else? We can inject uh, methylene blue contrast. Uh, so that will... oh, How can you see methylene blue until you divide the urethra? You cannot feel the buji. You cannot see the light. Then any other option you have. The scope is inside. Scope is inside the prostate urethra. Right. You can do is you can put in a needle from outside from the suspected site of uh, yes. proximal stump and you can see from uh, inside 
that it is piercing that is another way so actually the you should not hesitate in putting your finger in the rectum you should ensure that you have passed the bhuji to the bladder neck and it should not taint the bladder maybe other part of the bladder may be getting tainted and you may start feeding it something and you may create false passage that's why you can revise you can put the rediscope or flexible scope from above yeah you have been in right direction and then you feel through the rectum the proceed in this case is not big sir so i may be that i will be able to feel the tip of the bhuji perectally at least so that i will see by putting thumb in the perineum and the inject index finger in the rectum how much is the distance between the two so that the scar tissue can be excised accordingly so you have to make accurate judgment before again uh, otherwise you will call your senior that's also good answer okay i think with know? this uh, with this uh, we stop uh, this is almost uh, two hours now right that's right and yes, uh, i must uh, thank uh, dr sk singh dr sudhir devana dr devanshu for taking out the time at this uh, odd time and i must also thank uh, the ipca people that uh, they have done so much of a ground work and coordinated with lot of patient a uh, lot of uh, students and aditya you have done quite well you have answered quite uh, well and basically the whole idea is that what answers you give are the uh, answers which are given by almost every person and what mistakes you do are done by almost every person in the exam and what dr sk singh dr sudhir dr devanshu they have asked are the same questions which are likely to uh, be asked in exam so this is sort of a rehearsal for all the students who are logged in and they are watching this is a rehearsal for you so remember this also uh, is is giving you the uh, idea that these are the current examiners they will be uh, asking such questions and therefore when such uh, case comes in you must have answer ready made in your mind because yes. these are the questions so when question comes you have to answer immediately so that yes. gives a lot of impression it creates impression in the exam ultimately in exam practical exam how you create impression is important examiner should feel that he is well read his concepts are clear and is a safe urologist to be sent to the uh, community uh, to practice once that is understood i think passing is not no problem at all so with this now uh, dr amit your last remarks and then we'll wind up that's very nicely told yeah dr amit is he there dr amit goes admit unmute, unmute yourself amit you have to unmute yes. yes 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 okay i think this was a fantastic class i think the first theory uh, was by uh, uh, dr divana was really good and useful and and the viva also i think um, people must break the fear of sk singh by through after this <laughs> Oh, that's right. good. Very nice. That's good. That's good. I think yeah, stitcher is a very common problem. I think no very common problem. Examination of urology is complete without dealing with yeah. stitcher urethra. So you are likely to get get one case at least a deuthal stitcher right. or Absolutely. posterior deuthal stitcher. Yeah. So, so again, that's why they are choosing. Your face, doctor is kissing. So your half work is done. <laughs> you should now aditya you should now uh, you should now aim for honors marks you conquered <laughs> yeah. you conquered sk singh right. that's it uh, you have passed the well exam done. yeah you have passed the exam but yes you should score a higher mark that's right for okay. this thank you everybody right. okay, thank, thank you, thank you very, very much yeah. Bye. yeah nice to meet all of thank you, you. Uh, thank you very okay. much all. bye bye good night good night and uh, all exam going my best of luck to all of you yeah perform well study well Sir, well, then you will. We are not leaving you. You are going to come back again. Thank you. Thank you, Gosda. Bye, 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 Doctor Dhir. Thank you, sir. Bye, bye, Doctor Devasu. Bye, Doctor Ditya. Bye.